Hello, if you're new to Godot and you think you might want to use rigid bodies in your games, this video is for you. Recently, I've been seeing a lot of confusion among new users who are confused about how physics works in Godot. This video will show you how rigid bodies work, some of their most commonly used properties, and how to properly work with them in code. While the examples in this video are in 2D, the same lessons apply to using rigid bodies in 3D as well. Godot has three physics body types rigid, static, and kinematic. And rigid body is the one that provides simulated physics. And what this means is that you don't control a rigid body 2D directly. Instead, you apply forces to it, things like gravity, impulses, things like that. And Godot's built-in physics engine will calculate the resulting movement and figure out collisions, bouncing, whether something starts spinning, that kind of thing. So we jump into Godot. When you add a rigid body 2D, you'll see a lot of properties show up over here in the inspector. And this is where you can set things like the mass of the body, the friction, the bounciness, if you want it to uh, respond to gravity or not. A lot of properties can be set directly right here in the inspector. Now the body is also affected by, in the project settings, there is a physics 2D section where you can have your global gravity and friction settings and all rigid bodies will be affected by those unless you set them to ignore them. Now one of the benefits of using a rigid body is that a lot of behavior can be gotten for free without having to write any code. For example, let's look at making a rudimentary Angry Birds style game where you have falling blocks and you throw a projectile to try and knock them down. You only need to create rigid body 2Ds for the blocks and the projectile and set their properties. The stacking, the falling, the bouncing, all that stuff will automatically be handled by the physics engine. So for the blocks we're going to use, I've created a new scene here and the block is a rigid body 2D and it has two children, a sprite, so we can give it a texture, and a collision shape 2D. And of course all Collision objects have to have a collision shape or they won't be able to collide with anything. And the for the textures that I'm using, I'm using a, an art pack from Kenny that is for physics and has lots of different textures and types of blocks. And I'll link to that below if you want to grab that too. But you can use any other uh, textures that you want to use for this. And then I've added a rectangular collision shape on top of it to outline it. And if you haven't watched one of my videos before, I'm going to reiterate, uh, never, ever, ever do this with your collision shape. Things will not act properly if you scale a collision shape. You need to always, whatever collision shape you're using is going to have size handles on them. And you're going to use those to change the extents or the radius or whatever property of the collision shape to make it the size you want. If you wanted your block to be bigger, you're not going to scale the rigid body. If you scale a rigid body, the physics engine will automatically scale it back to one to one size when you hit run and all that will go away. If you want a bigger object, you scale the sprite, make the sprite bigger, and then scale the collision, you know, size the collision shape to match that. So now if you drag this block to somewhere around the middle of your screen and run the scene, you will see the block fall downwards. Now yours might be falling a little bit slower than mine, and that's because I've gone over here and set the gravity scale to 3. This multiplies gravity by 3 for the block, so it falls a little bit faster than the default uh, which you should have set to 1. So now I've made a new scene and I've created a bunch of static body 2Ds. And these are going to be my walls and floor. And these are just static body 2Ds with a sprite and a collision shape, just like we've done before. And I just grouped these in a group called walls so that I could hide them all like that. And then I instanced a bunch of the blocks that we just made, five of them to be precise, and I've stacked them up. So when you hit run, you will see that stack of blocks just sort of sitting there. And now we need our projectile. The projectile is one more rigid body 2D with a sprite and a collision shape. Uh, this time I've used a round 
texture so that it'll look like a ball. And we're gonna throw that at the blocks to knock them over. And for a rigid body to move, it needs to have some sort of velocity. And you can give a body an initial velocity right here in the inspector under linear, there's velocity. So we're gonna set that to 500 comma zero. So it's gonna be moving to the right. And now if you hit play, you will see the ball flies to the right and when it hits the blocks, they come tumbling down. You can also play around with the ball's friction and bounce properties. I like a bounce of around 0 0.5, makes the ball not just come to a complete stop when it hits the wall, but bounce off a little bit. And friction will determine how slippery it is on contact with other objects. Now for the next part, let's set the velocity back to 0, 0. And let's say we want to be able to toss the ball at the blocks. In code, you should never set a rigid body's velocity or position manually. These objects are simulating real-world physics, and in the real world, objects can't instantly jump from place to place or go from a standstill to a high speed in zero time. Uh, and if you try and do so in code, the physics engine is going to resist you, and you can get unexpected results. So instead, we have to apply forces, which can create an acceleration in a certain direction, aka Newton's second law. To add a force to a rigid body, you've got two functions to choose from. Add force and apply impulse. Add force is like adding a continuous force to the body. Uh, if you think about a rocket, when, it's, when the rocket is firing, it's steadily pushing it faster and faster. That's a, an added force. And also note that this adds to any existing forces that are on it. So the force will continue to be applied until it's removed. Apply impulse is more like an instantaneous kick, sort of like hitting a baseball with a baseball bat. So we're going to use apply impulse to kick the ball when we click the mouse, drag it in a certain direction, and release. It's going to kick it in the direction that we dragged away from. To capture the mouse click, I've gone into the project settings under input map and added a new action called click. And then I clicked the plus here and added the left mouse button. So this click event will fire whenever I use the left mouse button. Then we're going to add a script to the sprite, or to the ball. And here's that script. So we have two variables. One, dragging is going to keep track of whether we are currently in the drag state or not, whether we're holding the mouse down and, and dragging or we've let go. And drag start is going to be used to store the mouse position when we clicked, so we know where we started. And then we have the input function here checking for the press or release action on click. And if we click it, we're going to set dragging to true and capture the mouse position. And when we let go, we're going to set dragging to false and capture the end point, the location where we let go. And then by subtracting end from start, we get the vector pointing from end to start. So we're going to push back in the direction like we pulled back and let go. And then we're going to apply an impulse. And apply impulse takes two parameters. The first one is an offset. How far off from the center of the body do you want this impulse applied? And so we're going to have that be zero. And then we're going to use our direction vector as the force that we're going to hit it with. And I'm multiplying by five here just to scale it up a bit. It's just an arbitrary number I decided to use uh, for this demonstration. Now when we play the scene, there's our ball. Now if I click and I drag, when I let go, the ball will go flying. And if I click and drag a longer distance, it's going to fly faster, and so on. Now if you try adding an offset to the impulse, say we set this to 40 comma 0, you're going to give a big spin to the ball when you launch it which is going to make it, see how it kind of kicks away the blocks when it hits them. And so you can just play around with a very small amount of code. We've got a lot of functionality happening. What about when you want a little bit more control, direct control over a rigid body 2D? Well, for this other scene that I've created, we're going to talk about making the classic asteroids style game. So I have a ship here 
and it needs to rotate when I press the left and right arrow keys and it needs to move forward when I press the up arrow. So I've made my rigid body ship and the sprite and the collision shape. Uh, one thing to note if you're using my art, the image comes pointing upwards and in Godot 3, zero degrees means pointing along the x-axis to the right. So if we want the rotation of the ship to match the rotation of the body, you need to go into the sprite and add a 90 degree rotation to it. So let's talk about control. So by default, the physics settings have some damping in them in the project settings, which will reduce a body's velocity and its spin. In space, there's no friction. So in a realistic space game, you wouldn't want any damping at all. But for asteroids, we want the ship to stop rotating pretty quickly when we let go of the side arrow keys. And we also want it to slow down a little bit when we let go of the thrust. So what I've done here is I've gone in and changed the linear damp to 0 0.5, which is a little bit bigger than the default, which is 0 0.1. And I've set the angular damp to 5, which is much higher than the default, and is going to make the rotation stop pretty quickly when we let go of the arrow key. And here's the script for our ship. Feel free to pause this if you want to take a look at it uh, for a minute before I scroll down. Uh, we have two important setting variables here. The engine thrust, which is going to be the power of the engine when we press the up arrow, and then the spin thrust, which is how quickly it, you know, how fast it rotates when we press the side arrow keys. Thrust is going to be the actual engine thrust. It's going to be zero when it's not on, and it's going to be, you know, this, this a vector with this magnitude when it is on. The rotation direction is going to be tracking whether we're rotating to the left or the right. And then we're going to capture in the ready the screen size. Uh, we're not going to use that yet, but that's something we're going to use a little bit later. So I went ahead and put it in here. Then I have a function here to get the input. We check for the up arrow and if it is pressed, we're going to set the thrust and otherwise we'll set the thrust to zero and then we capture the right and left and add or subtract from direction so that we get a one, a zero, or a negative one for direction of rotation. And we call that input func get input function every frame in our process function. And then here I have the physics process and we're going to set the applied force to the rigid body to that thrust rotated by whatever direction our ship is rotated in, and then we're going to set the applied torque. Applied torque applies a rotational velocity, or sorry, a rotational acceleration to the body, and so we take our rotation direction and multiply by the spin thrust. Now when you go over to the inspector, you want to set those values. I have engine thrust set to 500, and I have spin thrust set to 25,000. In Godot units, torque winds up having some pretty large numbers, but uh, go ahead and set those and you can see how it will work if we hit run. Now I can rotate with left and right and I can press forward and I get some good asteroid style flying around the screen. Now here's where people start getting into trouble. If you remember the classic Asteroids game, the way that the ship flies is when it goes off the edge of the screen, it comes in on the other side, giving us a wraparound effect on the screen. Uh, it also has a hyperspace function where when you press the hyperspace button, the ship teleports to another location. And those are basically the same thing. When you go off one side, you're teleporting to the other side. And we talked about how, about, you know, a little earlier, how you can't change a rigid body's position directly without breaking the physics engine. And so this is where people run into a lot of trouble when they're trying to do customized things with rigid bodies. A really common mistake I see people make is trying to do something like this. So we've added some ifs to the physics process saying that if we, you know, reach, if we pass one screen edge, we teleport over to the opposite screen edge and update the 
node's position. Remember, the position is a node 2D property. It has nothing to do with physics. And so what's going to happen when we run this is everything looks fine right now until we hit the edge. And then we become stuck. I'm holding the I'm holding the thrust button down and we are not moving. And depending on how we do this, we might suddenly teleport off. But what happens is the physics engine is trying to move the body continuously, but our script is trying to teleport it. And those two are fighting each other and it's just not coming out good at all. So don't ever do this. Now I think part of the problem here comes from people assuming that physics process means this is where you do physics stuff. But what physics process means is that this delta and this function is called in sync with the physics engine, with the physics frames. But that doesn't mean that it's safe to do things like change the physics body's position inside it. And if you look at the docs for rigid body, the answers are all there. If you scroll down to the description, you will see right here this note. If you need to directly affect the body's state, use integrate forces, which allows you to directly access the physics state. So integrate forces, and if we go look at the description of that, allows you to read and, very important here, safely modify the simulation state of the object. Use this instead of physics process if you need to directly change the body's position or other physics properties. So that's what we need to do. We need to use this integrate forces callback instead. And the integrate forces callback has one parameter it passes you, which is the physics 2D direct body state, which is an object that contains a whole bunch of information about the current state of the body, whether it's colliding, how it's moving, what its gravity is experiencing is, what its uh, applied forces are, everything like that. And what we're really concerned with for our purposes here is its location, which is contained in its transform. So we have set transform here, and we have get transform here. And that's where we can find out what the current position, rotation of our body is, and set those parameters as well. So here's our updated script. I'm getting rid of physics process, and I'm putting these applied force and applied torque statements into integrate forces. And then I'm adding the following code to do the teleporting. So we get the current transform stored in this xform variable. And the position of the body is encoded in the origin of the transform. And so the x is what we check to teleport to the left and right, and the y is what we check to teleport to the uh, upper and lower edges of the screen. Then we take that new transform that we've modified and we set it back to the state. And now we should have very smooth, happy teleporting that does not confuse the physics engine and doesn't conflict with any of the forces that are being applied. You see I still continue to move in, a, in the same direction after I'm teleporting. My rotation isn't affected, and we're no longer getting stuck on the edges of the screen. So if you're going to be working with Rigid Body 2D, Integrate Forces is your friend. Learn how to use it, get, get familiar with it, experiment with it. It's going to make your life easier. And uh, one other thing I'll comment on, which is that people get confused about, is the Rigid Body also has a property called Custom Integrator. Custom Integrator lets you override the physics engine entirely and do and figure out the forces on the body yourself. Now, if you do enable custom integrator, you set this to true, then you will write that code in the integrate forces function. 
but that's not to imply that the integrate forces function is only for custom integration. Now, you know, the previous project we worked on, I did not ever touch the custom integrator. I'm perfectly happy with the built-in physics engine doing what I wanted to do. I'm using the integrate forces so that I can access that physics state. So these two can work together, but they are not, you know, integrate forces does not require you to be using a custom integrator. Uh, a lot of people get confused about that, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll do a, a PR to this uh, documentation to sort of try and make that a little clearer. All right, hope this was helpful to you in your projects where you're trying to use Rigid Body 2D. Please let me know in the comments below if you have any questions, and thanks for watching.